Heavenly Father, speak to us, speak through me. Let this be impactful and pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so welcome, welcome, welcome. It's good to see you all. Remember I announced last month that um, we were unsure about today, but since there was a cancellation, it all worked out, so we just went ahead and continued. So the main goals for the study today, our topic is church and state, are you in or out? Now, this is, I'm not going to touch, I'm going to touch a little bit on the religious liberty part because it comes in there, but I'm not going to do a full-scale presentation on that. So you'll get some of that, but I was going to save that for the presenter who's going to come and do that here for us. So our main goals, number one, we're going to examine how the current climate will contribute to the image of the beast. Number two, we're going to identify the second beast in Revelation chapter 13. Number three, we're going to explain the meaning of an image to the beast and church and state union. So we're going to break that down. And then number four, we're going to discover the various ways how the image is being formed today. So I want to start off with a spirit of prophecy quote, and this is taken from Last Day Events, page 34. God gives no man a message that it will be five years or 10 years or 20 years before this earth's history shall close. He would not give any living being an excuse for delaying the preparation for his appearing. Skip down to paragraph three. Because the times repeatedly set have passed, the world is in a more decided state of unbelief than before in regard to the near advent of Christ. So because of time setters, we're told that many people are starting to doubt and not believe because people are basically predicting dates, right? Now, next part here. They look upon the failures of the time setters with disgust, and because men have been so deceived, they turn from the truth substantiated by the word of God that the end of all things is at hand. All right. Now, I want to start off. I want to show you this billboard. This is a real billboard. My brother sent me this from Sioux Falls, South Dakota. I want you to take a look at this. That's a real billboard. I'm going to read it just in case you can't see it. No God, no devil, no heaven, no hell. There's no proof of the supernatural, so prayer doesn't work. We're on our own. Hmm. Now, of course, it says paid for by SiouxFallsAtheist.com. So, and you know what he told me? He said, these are spread all throughout the city. So now I'm going to make a connection here. You're going to see how all this comes together. Because groups like this, now here's my question for you all. Would this group accept the mark of the beast? So first, we, I mean, each individual, right, they have their choice. Who knows what they're going to do at that moment? But I hear some yeses in the crowd. But remember, they're saying that there's no God, there's no anything. But we have learned there's some other movements that will kind of encourage the atheists to say, well, you know what? We have to care for the environment, right? So there's other things. And I want you all to check this. So here's a couple things I want to um, go over. So these types of movements and beliefs will be more seen as morality declines. And this is where the church and state issue is important. Because as things get bad, right? Look, look at this. Look behind the screen. You guys know all these shootings we're having? We're having? So as things get real bad, what's going to happen? You're going to have some people are going to turn away from God and say, you know what? I'm done. I don't believe. But then there's another group that's going to say, see, we have to make society more moral. And how are we going to do that? We have to use the arm of the state. And so we're going to touch upon that coming up. And here's a quick graphic for you. So they said just this last year, there has been uh, 213 mass shootings. Now, the numbers vary. You have 213. Another one says 268. But it all depends on what they define as a mass shooting. Some charts, they say if it's three or more people. Some say if it's 10 or more. So it just depends. Now, again, these are things that are going to cause people to say, I don't believe. Look at this. Here's another one. Russia's induced global food crisis pushes 49 million to the brink of famine. So in other words, the world is going to look for solutions. I mean, are we in troublous times, brothers and sisters? Here's another one. 
The economy is going into the toilet. Let's hope no one flushes it. All right. Now, <laughs> now <laughs> what is all this saying? We are told, remember, Christ told us in Matthew 24, we shall see wars, rumors of wars, pestilences, famines, earthquakes, and diverse places. So these things are going to continue, and the economy is a big one because that impacts how people get their food, how you pay your rent, how you do everything. So eyes are watching what's going on here. We are told, Great Controversy, page 589, while appearing to the children of men as a great physician who can heal all their maladies, he will bring disease and disaster until populous cities are reduced to ruin and desolation. Even now he is at work in accidents and calamities by sea, by land, in great conflagrations and fierce tornadoes, hailstorms, tempests, floods, cyclones, tidal waves, earthquakes, and you can even add shootings and despair. We're going to add that in there. In every place and in a thousand forms, Satan is exercising his power. He sweeps away the ripening harvest and famine and distress follow. He imparts to the air a deadly taint and thousands perish by the pestilence. Now, here's the point. These visitations are to become more and more frequent and disastrous. Destruction will be upon both man and beast. Now, how many of you are familiar with the first 10 amendments. You guys know the first 10 minutes, amendments? They're also called the Bill of Rights. Now, we're not gonna have a quiz on that, but do you know that most Americans, okay, which ones do you think most Americans know? One yeah, <laughs> yeah, right? Number one, right? Free speech, free speech, freedom of religion, free to assembly, and then what's the second one? Right to bear arms, that's it. I guarantee if you start asking them, okay, what's the next one? What's the next one? Most Americans don't know that. And so I want to quickly spotlight, because the topic is about church and state, we're going to dig a little bit into the religious liberty issue. So in the First Amendment, we have something called the Establishment Clause. And this clause basically says this, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, so they can't establish one or say, okay, we're going to set this one up, or prohibit the free exercise thereof, so they cannot stop people from practicing their religious convictions and beliefs, or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right of the people peacefully to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Now, look at this. In this clause, this clause not only forbids the government from establishing official religion, but at this they also cannot prohibit and stop people from exercising. Now, a little bit on the, on the establishment clause and the religious issue. You all know, as Sabbath keepers, there has been some battles over the years, right? You guys have all heard of these? Where, what's the biggest one? Your boss comes to you and says, what? I need you to work on Saturday, yeah. And you say, oh, I can't work on Saturday. That's my Sabbath. Say, well, you work or you're going to have to find another place to get your paycheck. So there has been victories from our church where we have um, individuals that fight on behalf and petition those that are in need. And you also have the opposite going on where sometimes they help the Sabbath keeper and sometimes the powers that be say, no, nah, we're sorry, we can't do anything about it. So like I said, I'm not going to dig too deep into that specific part. I'll save that for the other speaker. But we're going to look at when church and state unites. And we know Bible and spirit of prophecy tells us it's coming. And we're getting closer and closer. And I'm going to show you some current events that show us just how close we are getting. So to start us off, Revelation chapter 13, you all know this. There are two beasts that John beholds. We have the first beast and the second beast. Chapter 13, and for a moment, let's just focus on the second beast. Now, a lot of this is going to be review, especially, you know, we've grown up Adventists. We've heard all this before. And then I'm going to show you how close we are and what we need to do for preparation. So here we go. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb. Oh, but how did he speak, though? He spoke as a dragon. Very good. 
and he exercises all the power of the first beast before him and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. We'll get to that in a moment. And he doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. Now, what is he saying? Saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship. The, so we're going to break all this down in the next few moments. Many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed, and he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hands or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Now, so this second beast, and you all know, and I'm going to ask you this question now. The second beast is who? What nation? Very good. United States. All right. We're told. Last day events, page 227. The Lord has shown me. Now watch this. Sister White explains probation. When everything is done, the time of testing is done. She says that will not happen until the image of the beast is formed. Now we're going to break down what is that image. Here it is. The Lord has shown me clearly that the image of the beast will be formed before probation closes. For it is to be the great test for the people of God by which their eternal destiny will be decided. All right. Now, we have to, and this is going to be really just a quick overview. Now, before we get too, too deep into the second beast, we have to figure out, well, who's the first beast? And the first beast, and let me just say this, I always have a qualifying point here, that remember, we're looking at Bible prophecy and we're looking at systems and players that the Bible represent. We're not talking about the individual people and followers of, for example, the Catholic faith, because God's going to call many of them out into his truth. Amen. So we're not talking about attacking the people to be the people. We're looking at what the Bible has clearly showed us in his word. So the characteristics of the first beast. Now, this is found in Revelation chapter 13, you can also find this in Daniel chapter 7 and Daniel chapter 8, that little horn power. So number one, it rises from the sea. Oh, let me ask you guys. The sea, what does that represent? Come on. Very good. Yeah, that's the people. Very good. So that's number one. Number two, the dragon gives it power and great authority. Okay, question. Who's the dragon? So it has many, it has many um, examples. Number one, primary sense, it's the devil, right? The dragon, the great dragon. But number two, it represents who else? Civil powers. So dragons also represent state powers. All right. Now, and that's, you can see that when um, in Ezekiel, he refers to, um, Pharaoh, as he says, tell Pharaoh that great dragon. So that's where you made the connection there. All right, number three, it receives a deadly wound. And you all know I'm coming to all that in a second. Number four, the deadly wound will be healed. And do you all know that it's being healed? Well, well let me slow down. Let's talk about all these things. I want to get ahead of myself. All right, number five, strong political power. Number six, it's also strong religious power. Number seven, guilty of blasphemy. And then just quickly, these 10 points. Number eight, it wars with and overcomes the saints. Number nine, it rules for 42 months. That's 1,260 years. And then number 10, it has the number 666. Well, after all that research and digging, and you can come to the conclusion that this is none other than the papacy. All right. Now, quiz time. How did the papacy, when it says he received a deadly wound, how did that happen? What's the story? Just shout it out. Who captured him? <laughs> Very good. Yeah. Berthier captured who? The? The Pope. Very good. Okay, give me the year. Yeah, 1798. You got some Bible scholars in here. All right. So, and that's exactly what it is. 
So in 1798, General Berthier, he comes in, captures the Pope, and that's the deadly wound. Now, we want to look at the deadly wound being healed. What does that mean? It means that he's going to get his clout, his influence back. And you all know with the papacy, he's all over the place, right? The Pope, he's in every country. People bow down to him. They kiss his hand. And so we know that he is none other. He represents that first beast. Now, while this is going on, we have the second beast that emerges around the same time. This, you all know, is going to be none other than the United States of America. And I want to break this part down quickly. So in Revelation 13, verse 11, the second beast is coming out of the earth. If the sea represents a lot of people, then that means the earth is going to be a lot of people or less people? Less people. And that, of course, you all know from history, Native American civilizations that were here in North America, those numbers compared to the numbers in Europe that were exploding at the scene during that time. All right, now, so the earth represents unoccupied territory, and it's the opposite of water. So let's keep skipping through. Now, notice in verse 10, the first beast gets a deadly wound, and around the same time, another beast emerges, and we know that that's none other than the United States of America. Now, here is a question for you all. The United States of America, 1798, the United States, okay, we declared our independence when? 1776, there we go. So in 1798, Washington is finished and you have Adams. Adams is at the helm during this time. So America is starting to rise as a world power and it's starting to be recognized. Now it's interesting because in Revelation chapter 13, the latter part, it describes America as this lamb-like beast with two horns. Now I want to show you a current event. It's, okay, it's not current, but it happened under uh, former President Barack Obama. And do you guys know what he named? Further clarification, President Obama signs a bill declaring the bison the national mammal. If you look at the bison, the two-horned beast, right? So it's more um, confirmation that this lamb-like beast. Now, hold on before I go to it. Why would, they, why would the Bible say it's a lamb-like beast? Because what is a lamb? Is a lamb rough and aggressive or is it? Is it, is it gentle? Is it, a lamb is, you know, loving and, and soft and gentle. It's the latter, right? Yes. But hold on. It says it will speak as a dragon. So speaking as a dragon, oh, okay, I'm asking now. How does a nation speak? Yeah, very good. <laughs> Give that man a reward over there, okay. Through his legislation. <laughs> Thank you, Norm. <laughs> All right, very good. So let's roll. So notice the lamb-like beast. And now think about this. In America, we know for years, America's like, oh, they're the, they're the country that goes and helps, right? America goes and will rescue people. And we have special missions and we're here for the free. And you say, yes, there's, a, there's truth in that. And the Bible confirms it, lamb-like. But then it will speak as a dragon. And so one of the things, brothers and sisters, we have to realize is that the freedoms that we now enjoy, soon they're going to be washed away. And it's hard for many of us to believe that, especially those of the, the older generation, because, you know, they grew up World War II and all that, and we're fighting for freedom. We're fighting to defend our 27 amendments, right? But a time is going to come when that's going to be washed away. And for many, you, you all know that that's going to be a surprise. For many, that's going to come on them unawares. They're going to say, huh? We, we can't do that. But some people in the world are seeing this. And I hate to say it, brothers and sisters, but some people in the world, they are becoming wiser than God's children. Mm. They see that something's not right. They're taking freedoms and rights away. But for some of us, we don't see it. All right, let's keep going. So a lamb-like beast is gentle, it's innocent, peace-loving, and it speaks as a dragon. And of course, it's through its legislative laws. Now, here's the part I want to get to. 
we're going to talk about now the formation of church and state. And I'm going to show you some current events. We're also going to look at um, the Bible and spirit of prophecy on what that means. Now, some people in the world believe that that's a good thing. We need to have more religion in the government, more religion making decisions. And you have others, and we know our movement, we understand that that's not a good thing because they're going to take away our freedom of worship. All right, Revelation 12, verse 3 to 4. How does a nation speak? It speaks through its laws. And one of the things that I want to go ahead and I want to read this to you. This is taken from Great Controversy, page 441. And he had two horns like a lamb. The lamb-like horns indicate youth, innocence, gentleness, fitly representing the character of the United States when presented to the prophet as coming up in 1798. Among the Christian exiles who first fled to America and sought an asylum from royal oppression and priestly intolerance were many who determined to establish a government upon the broad foundation of, oh, here it is now, civil and religious liberty. You have republicanism. That's a government without a king. People can vote, representative government. And then you also have Protestantism. That's a church without a pope. Now, guess what she says? These are the, oh, you know, Sister White said these are the secrets of America's power. Protestantism and republicanism. Now, if you break one of those, the other one is barely hanging on and it's going to falter. So, for example, we still have our democracy in America. We still have our voting. So republicanism is still going on. Protestantism, though, is under attack. I don't know if you all remember back in 2017, you had the 500th year of um, Luther's nailing the 95 Theses on the church door, and the church basically said, the protest is over. There's no more Protestant Reformation. That's what they said. And so that one is almost broken. So then we have to wait until they attack those first 10 amendments and then they're swept away. Republicanism is going to be gone the right to choose in the United States. All right, let's keep going. So Revelation 13, verse 12, and he exercises all power of the first beast before him and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And the U.S. will become, now watch this. I know this is tough, right? Because we try to be, you know, patriotic. We're Americans. We're proud. So this next part is tough. But what's going to happen in this country? The U.S. will become a persecuting power and will force people to go against their conscience like Rome. Now watch this. The United States is going to be copying what Rome did, what the papacy did. The U.S. will lead nations of the world in forcing worship as allegiance to papal antichrist. And notice the issue is over worship. Now we're getting to the point here. Where now, and I'm going to read you a quote where Sister White describes when you talk about church and state union, do you know why churches seek after help of the government? And they're like, hey, you need to pass this law. Hey, you need to do this. Does that show that they're strong or weak? Weak. That means their message is not strong because the ever oh, the everlasting gospel and God's grace and his love and his character that gets imparted in us. If your message is strong and it's the truth and it's thus saith the Lord, you don't need the government to say, hey, government, in, enforce that law. You know, stop that. They're being bad. You don't need that if your message is going out across the world and it's strong. Amen. All right. So keep that in mind as we continue. So Revelation 13, 14. And he deceived them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image. Now we're getting to the image. So in the Bible, well, even just not even in the Bible, if you hear the word an image, what does that mean? It can mean a couple things. Somebody throw something out. Image is what? 
Okay, likeness, right? Very good. They also refer to idols, right? Like somebody sets up a big idol and say, that's an image. Now, likeness here is very interesting because we are told, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Now, watch this. Back in the early... uh, 500 A.D., and that's when we know 538, the papacy got his power, right? Great seat and authority. During this time, what occurred is that the civil power basically gave power to the church and said, you go ahead and you can run things. Now, here's the interesting part. The image to the beast is a copy of the joining of church and state that the papacy did. So notice now. America is going to follow that same joining of church and state. Just like Rome did, they're going to do the same. In other words, they're going to let churchmen run the country and get their decrees passed. Now, we had a lot of this. There was a lot of activity. When Trump was in office, there was a lot of activity. But I'm still going to show you we, see, we still see movements of that today that's taking place. Now, what happened Churchmen, they have to get the religious, sorry, they have to get the state to influence their decrees. Now, the first one I'm going to show you here. You guys remember what happened in A.D. 321? You all heard of, what's his name? Starts with a C. Constantine, remember? Constantine makes the first Sunday law. Now, here's the thing, though. Who urged him to do it? The bishops of Rome, it was churchmen that said, hey, look, we have to unite the kingdom. Go ahead, make this law. We could bring the pagans and the Christians together under one roof, and then boom, it'll be easier to get our power. Now, so then the question is this. If America is the lamb-like beast that is the image, so it's going to be and do exactly what Rome did, that means we're going to see that repeated. So we have to be on, our antennas have to be up when we hear about churchmen saying, hey, we got to get back into the state. We got to pass laws. Like, for example, and I want to, yeah, I'm going to read you this part. So this is taken from Great Controversy, page 53. In the early part of the 4th century, the Emperor Constantine issued a decree making Sunday a public festival throughout the Roman Empire. The Day of the Sun was reverenced by his pagan subjects and was honored by Christians. It was the emperor's policy to unite the conflicting interests of heathenism and Christianity. He was urged to do this by the bishops of the church who, inspired by ambition and thirst for power, perceived that if the same day was observed by both Christians and the heathen, it would promote the nominal acceptance of Christianity by pagans. So notice how they start off. They say, look, if we can get everybody to worship on the same day, so everybody will worship on Sunday, the day of the sun, this will make our power and influence great. Now, let's go to some current events. Do you guys know because of, let me, okay, let me say this first. You all know we have an inspired messenger in Ellen White, amen? I mean, what she said is spot on, spot on. And she said they will call for a Sunday law because of immorality. She says to combat immorality and temporal prosperity. Now, watch this. I'm going back to the shootings. And do you know what the, some of the governors and the churchmen started to say now? Yeah, look at that heading. Republicans call for a return to God, prayer after Uvalde school shooting. Here's another one. Franklin Graham says shootings have a spiritual root. We have taken God out of schools. Do you all see what's happening? Now, before I go further in these, let's think about this. Now, there's two points. They are right to an extent where because people aren't reading and studying and they're not spiritual, of course, right? The media and all the violence they're seeing on TV, they're going to act out. The problem is this, though, urging the state and the schools to do something about it 
and you need to force people to, you know, pray, force them to read the Bible, force them to, is God about force? No, he gives you a choice. So here's another one. Now, many will start to say America is just out of hand. I saw some articles this week. They said America's moral compass is just, it's gone, right? Now, the more and more issues you have taking place, that's going to want them to create that image because now you want something done about it. We're tired of the shootings. We're tired of the violence. We're tired of all these movements that are taking people away from God and the Bible. So you all can see the argument. Here's another one. So you all know this, um, this study came out uh, a few days ago. It said a record number of Americans, including Republicans now, support same-sex marriage. Now, why did I bring this up? Because the more immorality that you have is filling up that cup. So eventually, people are going to say, okay, we had enough of this. We're going to have to fix these problems. Do you all follow me? Does everybody see what's going on? So the more problems and issues you have, the more it's going to give the argument of we have to do something. Here's another one. Mr. Gates. Okay, <laughs> you guys know. So what's the name of that new one now? It's called the monkey pox, right? Now, do you know back in 2021, here's what he said. He said he warns of smallpox terror attacks and urges leaders to use germ games to be free. Now, wait a minute. Again, it's either two things. He's spot on. How is he spot on like this all the time? So is he just, you know, he can foresee the future? Is that what's going on? Or perhaps is he in the circles, you know, concocting these things? And, and I mean, who knows, right? But what we're finding is this. The more you have pestilences, the more you have hailstorms, the more you have earthquakes and shootings. And this is where, brothers and sisters, we're going to need a great faith and we're going to need stronger faith than we have now. Amen? We're going to need it because it's going to get rough. Here's another one. Now, this, of course, happens every year, but Biden urges Congress to come together at annual national prayer breakfast. And I just want to read what this prayer breakfast is about. The annual multi-faith prayer breakfast is meant to bring bipartisan political leaders and their religious counterparts together to meet, pray, and build relationships. So in other words, remember, there's a mingling going on. That's church and state. And the thing about church and state, okay, I'm going to say this. We have to be careful within, even within our denomination that we're not doing things that are promoting church and state. Are you guys following me? Yeah, if we're mingling too much with, you know, the governments and the cities and getting good with them, oh, yeah, they know us, so they're, they're going to protect us. And I think over the years, that was some of the mindset. If they know who we are, Seventh-day Adventists, they're going to protect us when certain things go on. And this is where the religious liberty part has come to a stop when it comes to mingling with government because that same government is going to be the one that's going to actually persecute you and take away your freedoms. And that's Bible spirit of prophecy. I'm not making that up. All right, let's keep rolling. Look at this, another one. Representative Mo Brooks blames decline of moral values. You see, the shootings. They said, look, the shootings, America is bad, so something needs to be done. And that's where we're going to look at the image. Look, this one came out in 2018. Dallas pastor Jeffress blames church-state separation for school gun violence. So there it is, ladies and gentlemen. There it is. So when you start seeing chaos going on, just know the objective there is to form that image. Now, here's an interesting article I'm going to show you. This is from somebody who sees what's going on. So I don't know if you all remember when Trump was in office in 2017, 2018, et cetera, he had a large backing from evangelical Christians, right? They were all there, whatever he wants to do, because he's going to push our agenda. Well, now you have some individuals that are saying, you know what? That has poisoned them. You see? Because trying to get the government to pass your laws and degrees that actually shows that a church that's not that strong because they need the government's help to do it. Now, 
Great Controversy, page 443. When the early church became corrupted by departing from the simplicity of the gospel and accepting heathen rites and customs, she lost the spirit and power of God. And in order to control the consciences of the people, she sought the support of the secular power. The result was the papacy, a church that controlled the power of the state and employed it to further her own ends, especially for the punishment of heresy. Now watch this. Let's bring it home to the United States. We're rounding the corner. In order for the United States to form an image of the beast, the religious power must so control the civil government that the authority of the state will also be employed by the church to accomplish their own ends. Now, some people say, wait, oh, and I'm going to mess with you guys a little bit. Some people say, okay, right now it's 2022. Who is the president? Biden, right? Is he uh, Republican or Democrat? He's Democrat, right? So most people would argue and say, there's no Sunday law coming or anything like that because the Democrats, they don't push church and state. Have you guys heard that before? Yeah, so they, they say they don't push church and state. You got to worry when you have the other party that gets in and they're pushing church and state. But hold on. Remember, oh, this national Sunday law, this law encompasses not only it's going to get, we got to restore morality, the religious side, but remember now there's a climate change movement. And what is that climate change movement also calling for? Sunday rest. So that means you could very well have under a climate change movement a democratic push to say, look, we are going to Make Sunday a day of rest for the environment. The other side's like, great, that's what we wanted in the first place for thousands of years. And then boom, there it is. So brothers and sisters, we have to make sure that we're staying up, that we're not falling asleep. Yes. <laughs> All right. So in essence, apostate Protestants, churchmen, the United States will get the U.S. government to create an amendment to the U.S. Constitution that will enforce a Sunday law and there will be penalties jail time, and even death for some who will not observe Sunday rest. So the question is, are you ready? Are we getting our families ready? Are we praying? Are we fasting? I mean, if, we're, if God, if it's in his will to be alive when all this happens, we have to make sure that we're surrendering to him, which we talked about in Sabbath school, total surrender, and that we're relying and trusting on him to guide us through. And that's what we're going to need. So, Prophets and Kings, page 183. Human laws will be made so stringent that men and women will not dare to observe the seventh-day Sabbath for fear of wanting food and clothing. This is what the enemy says. They will join with the world in transgressing God's law. The earth will be holy under my dominion. That's what the enemy says as quoted in Prophets and Kings, page 183. All right. So last segment here. Very good. We're doing good on time. So what are some signs of the end? Luke 21, verse 12 to 14. But before all these, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues, to the prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. And it shall turn to you as a testimony. And what does Christ tell us? Should we worry about what we're going to say during that time? No. His spirit will give us the words to speak and they will not be able to combat it. Now, here's the part that I want us to focus on. Knowing that this union of church and state, it is real and it's, it's making its way in darkness. And so we as a people in a movement, we have to be careful with just joining with any movement, any social change movements. And we're like, yeah, yeah, let's go out there. And you have to be careful. Go out there and protest and fight for, because you have to see what's behind the movement. What are their beliefs and what's going on? All right. Next piece. So the Lord says, don't even worry about what you will say. 
For I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. Now, did, did church and state come together to persecute Jesus? Yes or no? Yes, they did. Who brought who, though? Oh, yes. Who brought who? The churchmen. The churchmen were the ones saying, look, look, we have this guy. Look, he claims to forgive sins. He claims to be God. It was so, oh, now, that same pattern, the church, churchmen, they're going to be the ones knocking on the government's door, saying, hey, you need to pass these laws. You want to preserve your seat and power? You want to change things? You need to pass. It's the same thing. And look what happened to Christ. Church and state came together. They persecuted him. They crucified Jesus. And so the lesson there is that, brothers and sisters, we have to be careful about our intermingling. And I'll just say it. There has been, and there's videos all about this, how some of our Adventist brothers and sisters are getting involved in ecumenical alliances. You got to be careful with that. You know, joining with other churches and government leaders and mayors and all. You got to be careful about that. Those would be the same ones that say, oh, yeah, we know, we know about those Sabbath keepers. They're the ones that, you know, they're not keeping Sunday. And Archelaus, you can go ahead and get ready for me. So last day events, page 136. The whole world is to be stirred with enmity against Seventh-day Adventists because they will not yield homage to the papacy by honoring Sunday, the institution of this anti-Christian power. And again, brothers and sisters, there are many that are going to come out of these churches and they're going to be led into God's truth. But we have to also do our part in evangelize and share. Amen. There will be many. You know, Sister White says thousands. Yes, more than the day of, okay, how many were converted on the day of Pentecost? Oh, hold on. 3,000, I almost gave away the answer. How many were converted and baptized? 3,000. So she said there will be thousands more than the day of Pentecost that are going to come into this truth. And we have to be the ones helping and leading and doing what we can. So we have to know that for us to make it through this time, we need prayer, we need fasting, and we got to trust and lean on God's word. You know, we have Isaiah 54, verse 17. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. We also have Psalm 37, 25. I have been young, and now I am old. I never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. And so these are the scriptures. Here's another one, Isaiah 33, verse 16. He shall dwell on high. His place of defense shall be munitions of the rocks. And bread shall be given him. His water shall be sure. So there's a plethora of scriptures that we have to rely on to make it through this time. Now, I'm going to show you all. Here is, and here's another one. Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the thoughts that I have towards you, thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you an expected end. Now, I'm going to show you a video clip. Don't worry, there's no, there's no sound, right? But let me give you the backstory of this, and Achilles is going to sing for us. We'll close out. So here's the backstory. One day, I'm walking from, you know, a community gym, and I'm coming out the gym, and I look, and I see this squirrel up there in a tree. And when I play it, you'll be able to see him moving. And when I looked at him, I didn't think much of him at first. But I noticed what he was doing. And there's a scripture that came, I kid you not, the scripture came to my mind as I was watching the squirrel. Here, look, I'm going to play it for you. Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me see if this will work here. Okay, let me see if this will work. I'm going to take it off that. I just did this. There we go. Oh, it's not showing it. What's going on? Let me see. Hold on. Oh. All right. And then I got to 
figure that out. It's moving on my end, but it's not showing for you guys. That's okay. Anyway, oh, messed it up. But what the squirrel is doing, he's eating and eating in that tree and eating and eating. And the scripture that came to my mind is the scripture which basically, what does God tell us about the birds of the air and the fowl? Do they have to worry about their food? No. So as I'm watching that squirrel that's sitting there eating, I'm reminded that God will take care of his people. Amen? He'll take care of us. And we don't have to worry about that. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for all the blessings you've given us. Thank you for giving us this opportunity to come before you and to pray. And we come on behalf of individuals that we know that need your help, whether it be a sickness, whether it be a job issue, a relationship issue. You know the people, and we just thank you for giving us this opportunity to present the names and the individuals to you. And we ask, Lord, that you may baptize us daily with your Holy Spirit. As we go out, Lord, as we enter into the week coming forward, we just pray that you use each and every single one of us to help lead a soul to you. We thank you, Lord, for your promises. We thank you for your word. And we just thank you, Lord, to know that you have taken care of us, that you are taking care of us, and that you will take care of us. Keep us faithful until you return. Help us not to give up and not to give in. And we ask all these blessings in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen and amen. All right. Thank you all. God bless you all. Uh, just a quick announcement. Um, as you go out, I still have Ministry of Healing books you can grab. There's still study guides you can grab. Look forward to being with you all next month. And the first Sabbath of the next month, the topic is don't be shaken out. And that's an important one for all of us that are inside the boat to make sure that we don't get shaken out of the boat. Anyway, God bless you all. We are dismissed. And I will see you all next time. Thank you all.